All right, great song. Written by a missionary. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, yesterday afternoon, I had the privilege, Susan and I did, to go with Brother Chuck down to um, Coleman Street in Rochester, an area that Chuck's been going to for how many years, Chuck? Five, about five years. Yeah, and uh, we were privileged to be with a couple pastors from Hamlin, New York, and some of their people. And what happens down there is uh, Chuck puts on a feast for them. Hamburgers and hot dogs, okay? And, and things that go, go with it. And uh, we got to walk around the neighborhoods and uh, give away packages for, for children. They're actually backpacks that have school things in them. And uh, other ones had uh, practical uh, things, personal items for people. And it's just a joy uh, to do something like that. That was between two and six last night. So, uh, you know what I discovered when you go down to a place like that that you wouldn't go normally to? They're just people like you and me. And they're in need of the Lord Jesus Christ. And a lot of good testimonies we heard down there. And uh, so we praise the Lord for that. Uh, that happens the last Saturday of every month, if you'd like to join us uh, in September. All right, this morning I'd like to speak to you about Paul's conception, though, of God. Paul's conception of God. And uh, we had the verse right up there for you on, on the screen, but it's Deuteronomy 6 and verse number 4 says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God... I'm sorry, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is one. So what we find, folks, in, in this verse, there is a, uh, by Paul, given an uncompromising monotheism. In other words, there's one God. That's what the writer here says. We, we assume that's Moses, you see. That is Moses. So in a world which believed in many gods, and the world still believes in many gods, all right? But at that time, many gods, the Jews believed in one God. And this is also Paul's thinking about God. Uh, 1 Corinthians, and you don't have to turn there, we'll be going later on. 1 Corinthians 8, 4 says, there is no God but one. Then two verses later in verse number 6, he says, for us, there is one God. So in Paul's mind and his theology, there's one God. But there is a second great dominant thought in all Paul's teachings concerning the one God. Let's come back to 1 Thessalonians, please. Turn over there with me. And chapter number 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Okay. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. There we are. Now notice, please, with me, verse number 1 where it says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, or Thessalonians, rather, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Now notice, God the Father. So the one God that Moses spoke about, that the Jews believed in, that Paul also believes in, he identifies him as whom? Father. He is our Father. And I think we have to keep that in mind and, and, and keep it in our hearts. There's one God, and He's God the Father. Now, if you go through all of Paul's epistles, what you're going to find is he begins every epistle. For example, 2 Thessalonians 1-2, God the Father. Galatians 1-3, God the Father. 1 Corinthians 1-3, God the Father. 2 Corinthians 1-2, God the Father. Romans 1-7, God the Father. Ephesians 1-2, God the Father. Thank you, Carl. Colossians 1, 2. God the Father. Philemon, verse 3. God the Father. 1 Timothy 1, 2. God the Father. 2 Timothy 1, 2. God the Father. Turn with me to Titus, please. Because something is added here to Titus. And we look at Titus 1, 3, and 4. Chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says this. And at the proper time manifest in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in, in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So what has Paul added here to God the Father? Savior. He's a Savior. 
God the Father is also our Savior, see? And that's very important. So therefore, if Paul were to say that there is one God and just leave it at that, okay? Say nothing else about it. The might and the majesty and the power of a lonely God would be secured and safeguarded. But Paul doesn't leave it there, you see. If Paul were to say that God is Father, the benevolent, the loving, and the good will of God would be stressed. And I believe that's why Paul adds God the Father. So we would know and could conceive in our own hearts that there's somebody that is benevolent, somebody does love us, and there's a good will that comes forth from this God, the one God who is our Father. So you put those two ideas together, a God who's power is always motivated by his love and whose love is always backed by his power. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? So when you look at 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 6 and he says, for there is one God, Paul is really solidifying to us where we find a God whose power will never be used except in love except in love, and whose loving purpose will never be frustrated. To me, that's a wonderment as you look at that. And you know, and that's kind of the theme that, that, that Dan III has been sharing with us over the last few months, you know, on Wednesday nights, about a God of love. But God not only is our Father, but let's look at something else about Him. Go on over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11, and I tell you what, also get Romans chapter 11 in your hands. See if you can do that. So 1 Corinthians 11 and Romans 11, all right? Two verses here. So first of all, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, notice please verse number 12. Uh, we very certain 11. Nevertheless, in the Lord, <coughs> in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made for man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from whom? All things are from God. All things. Come over to Romans 11 and notice verse 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. For from him and through him and to him are all things. What does that give you the idea of? About our God who is our Father and also our Savior, as Paul wrote. He's the creator of all. See? He is the creator of all. So when we join that idea... Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 the Son of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, what we find is this. The Lord Jesus Christ then was what? He was the mediator, or the instrumentality of what God had done. And we see that throughout the Scriptures. Uh, back to 1 Corinthians, if you would, in chapter number uh, 8, one more time. All right? And, and we'll finally look at this verse. Verse number 6. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, now notice what it says carefully, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist. Now think about it. Everything comes from Him, and it's for Him that we what? So why are you here? <laughs> You're here for Him. See? We are here for God. We might say, uh, you know, I was in the military, and, and on the ships I served on, uh, you know, every, every ship has a captain. And we served at his pleasure, okay? Because whatever the captain said was law at sea. It's same thing, the same principle goes, and that's where it came from, with our, our God. Okay, God, our God is one, our God is our Savior, and our God, from Him come all things, and we exist for Him, see? For His honor and glory, actually, as, as you read these verses, okay? And, but then it goes on, 
So, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through him are all things. See, through him. All things come from God, but it's through our Lord Jesus Christ, see, is what he's talking about. Whom are all things, and through whom we exist. So the Father and the Son working in tandem together, all right? But the Father above all, because he was the Father also of whom? Of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Jews had a problem with that. I'm just going to give you a little sidelight here. Uh, they really didn't have a problem too much with Jesus until he started connecting himself with God the Father. And to the Jews, and by the way, the word Father is only used not even a handful of times in the Old Testament. It was almost blasphemous for anybody to connect themselves with God as, as Father. But it was through Jesus that we learned Abba Father. Remember? All right, and what does Abba mean? Does anybody remember? We, we say Daddy, Daddy, because it was a word that little children would say, and it was a word of a compassion and love toward their father. And here, the Lord Jesus used it towards his father, and, and the Jewish folks couldn't get over that thing. Say, couldn't get over that. But we see a definite connection here. Uh, come over to Ephesians, if you would, and chapter number three. Ephesians chapter number three. Ephesians three, and let's notice, please, verse number nine. Uh, I better start in verse number eight, the beginning of a sentence here. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created what? So again, Paul mentions this. In God, he's the creator, see? It was a mystery, and, and Paul was allowed to bring forth the mystery of why God did these things. And so that brings us to Colossians chapter number 1. Turn over there. Colossians chapter number 1, please. And notice verse number 16. For by him, and him, let's go to 15, he is the image of the invisible God. So we're talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, the beloved Son, in verse 13. The firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Now notice, at the beginning, everything was created by him, but then at the end, he says, were created through him. He was the instrumentality that God used as the creator to bring creation into existence. You all see that? And, and the same thing can be read when we, we go to John chapter number one. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And then what's it say about it? Hey, everything, everything that came into being came through him. Say, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. Why does Paul make so much of God as creator and of the Son's part in the work of creation? And we've talked about this in the past numerous times. But the reason was is because of the Gnostics. You all remember that term? Gnosticism, the Gnostics. The Gnostics thought and believed there was a God they believed in numerous gods, but there was a God, and, and that God connected itself to those some believers, especially here in Colossians, all right? And he was, he was a good God. He was a great God, and they perceived him as the creator. But they had steps going down from God to his creation. They, they were called emanations. In other words, lesser gods, we might say angels, mediators, messengers, that sort of thing. And what they believed was this, that the further away you got from God on his throne in the, in the heavens, further down you got, the less you would know about him. Not us, but these emanations, okay? And so by the time they got to his creation, these emanations were evil. And therefore the creation was evil, see? And so what happens here is this, that further and further from God, we know less and less of him and become evil. Now, that was a common thought in the ancient world. So what does Paul do? Every book, God the Father, God the Father, God the Father. 
Then he brings out the fact, God the Creator. See? And connects that with whom? Jesus Christ, because these people believe that Jesus Christ was one of the emanations, but he was on the earth and not in the heavens, and therefore he must have been evil. And so Paul is straightening all that thinking out, bringing them together. See, it's, it's important to read sometimes a little history so you get the understanding of why these things were happening. So if Paul's view that <laughs> the God of creation was also an act of self-revelation. Now, Brother Dan Kramer just used this passage, but I'm going to use it again. Uh, come on back to Romans chapter number one, please. So his act of creation was also an act of self-revelation. We come back here to verse 19 of Romans chapter number 1. And let's notice 19 through 21, where it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So what suppresses the truth? Unrighteousness. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. How did he show it to them? Verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of what? Ever since the creation of the world. Uh, ESV has a note, clearly perceived from the creation of the world. Clearly it was there that there was a God that put this together. So in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. So ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, they are without excuse. Who's without excuse? The unrighteous ones, see, that you see up there in verse number 16. And what do the unrighteous do? They suppress the truth. And what were they suppressing the truth? What was Paul writing about here? They're suppressing the truth about the reality of God is what you see. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they came, became futile in what? In their thinking and their few, foolish hearts, foolish hearts were darkened. And this isn't limited, folks, to those folks that Paul is talking about and people from Adam's day and Noah's day and Abraham's day. We see it here today. Miss Rosemary just shared with us before the service uh, a, a uh, survey she read about where, how old were the kids? Christians, 60% of Christians between 18 and 39 think they can be saved by Muhammad and who else? And Buddha. So what's being taught in our churches today? Now th think about that. Untruth. And what's it say about untruth? Unrighteousness. Because unrighteousness bringeth forth the untruth. See? Ungodliness, if you please. And it's really a sad situation that people get away from the Word of God and let their own minds roam, especially when <laughs> they're futile. It says, but they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were what? Were darkened. I mean, that's a shame. But what's Paul trying to bring forth to us here? The idea that the Creator, say, the Creator has a part in our lives. So Paul saw God's hand now, and he perceived God's hands to be in his very spiritual pilgrimage, if you want to call it that. Come on back to Galatians. See if I can just give you three verses here. Uh, to show you this. Paul believed that God's hands was particular in his spiritual pilgrimage. And if you walk close to God, and I use that term, the realm of Jesus, when I say goodbye to everybody, I think that we need to understand that God's great desire, because he started a good work in us, Philippians 1, 6, right? And he will continue that work. It's his desire that we submit to that work so he can be part of our lives, you say. But I come over here to Galatians chapter number one. Notice verse 15 with me. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace. Again, my Bible has a note that says, set me apart from my mother's womb. So from the womb, Paul was set apart. 
for the purposes of God. Why do we exist? Same reason. For God, for his purposes, see? And we have to understand that. So when I flip back to Romans chapter 1, and you don't have to go with me here. Let me read this quickly, and I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 1.1 1, 1 next. Paul, in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, or a slave of Christ Jesus, or a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called to be apostle, now notice, set apart for the gospel of God. What's it mean to be set apart? You're sanctified, all right? You're set apart for a, a purpose. And what was the purpose here in, in Romans 1.1? 1, 1? Paul says, hey, I set apart for the gospel of God. Is it any wonder that when the Bible was finally put together, okay, the New Testament, let's say, was, was put together, that Romans was the first epistle of Paul's epistles, even though it wasn't written first? Why? Set apart for what? Gospel of God. He was set apart from the womb, say, for the purpose of God. We exist for the purpose of God. And I think we need to keep that in mind. So when I come back then to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, and verse number 1, it, sa it says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So he's set apart, that was the will of God. If we exist, it's by the what? Will of God. If it wasn't the will of God, you wouldn't be here. Doesn't matter who your parents are, okay? I often used to ask myself, actually, I'd ask God, how come I wasn't born a Rockefeller? You know. Born, it, born into the riches of the world, you know? And the same answer always comes. You have more riches than they'll ever dream of say <laughs> in, in this world so that that brings me over to Galatians 1 again I'll read it in verse 1 Paul an apostle not from men nor through man but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead so in, in just these three little verses Galatians 1 15 Romans 1 1 I should say 4 uh, 2nd Corinthians 1 1 and Galatians 1 1 what do we see that Paul believed that God had a hand in what and who he was and I think we can all say the same thing because we read, hey, we exist for whom? We exist for God, you see. So not just in world affairs, say, but in creation, in his own life, we see God working with us. Come back to 1 Corinthians. And I know I'm, I'm using a lot of verses here, but... Uh, I should probably take advantage of Miss Susan's computer abilities, but she already does too much, and I hate to overload her, because besides her computer abilities, she's a wonderful cook. I'd rather see that, okay? <laughs> We're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and notice, please, verse number 19. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and we'll find out not, <laughs> find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. Again, if the Lord wills. You see that? If the Lord wills. So we, we, we see that in the scriptures all through the place. You can see it in Romans 1.10. I'm not going to turn there. Also with Paul. Therefore, God, Paul believed, was a supplying God. If, he, if Paul existed for the purposes of God, he was called out by God, all right, for his purposes, and God must supply Paul with what he needs to fulfill what God has him to do. And so we go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, okay, and we read verse number 5 that says, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Brother Dan covered that this morning, but the whole thing is who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new uh, covenant. And verse number five, but we're not sufficient, see? Our sufficiency comes from God. That's the point I want to get across there in verse number five with verse number six, okay? It doesn't come from us, it comes from God. All right? It comes from God. You know that song that the Gettys uh, put music to, 
uh, it, 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 to me it's very sweet because it is a missionary song and that's who wrote it get over your what, what, what it was saying the one verse is get over your fears saying it kindly why are you fearful it's not of your sufficiency of, it's of whose God's you know as we were out on the street yesterday I was telling the folks earlier that um, of the 10, 12 folks that, that Susan and I got to speak with, there was only two that weren't receptive. And uh, <laughs> they were teenage boys. And you know what they had in their hands? Their phones, and they were playing games. Had their headphones on, they didn't want to be bothered. You know, and the, and the, and the young ladies that were with them Oh, yeah, we'll go with you. It's time for lunch, you know. And they went over and enjoyed some hamburgers and hot dogs. So not everybody, but not everybody's against you, see. God is sufficient. That's, that's the key that we see here. And he, he supplies what we need. And, and so what we find is, as we go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, notice this. All right. 2 Corinthians 12, please. Verse number nine says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Not his own power. It's the power of Christ. Say, who is Christ? The Son, the beloved Son of the Creator, of the Savior, of the Father. And He is the instrumentality by which God is taking all that He has and giving to us. All right? And I think we remember, need to remember that. Uh, uh, Philippians 4.9 also gives us that idea. Uh, let me read that to you. Philippians 4, 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be where? With you. See, it's God. He'll be with you. That's, that's the key here. Okay? That's the key. And, and I, I found this, this quote years ago by a fellow named John Buchan, and he said this, describing atheists. He says, atheist as a man who has no visible means of support of God. In other words, you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have a means of support. And that support, that sufficiency comes to us from our great God who is our Father and our Savior. But an atheist has none of that. It's there. He doesn't realize it because he doesn't believe that the God is there. So God was behind every single act of life of Jesus. In other words, as in, and you read the book of John, and it, it just brings it out. The, the Lord said, the, the words that I speak, they're my Father's words, not my own. The acts that I do, they're from the Father, you see. So God was behind even the, incarna the incarnation, his, his coming into the world. Uh, come back to Romans with me. All right. Romans chapter number 8 is what we want. Romans 8. Does anybody know off the top of their heads what Galatians 4.4 4 says? Born of a woman. <laughs> yeah. In the fullness of time, Christ came. Born of a woman under the law. Y'all remember that? He came at the right time. The time that God the Father wanted him to come. And I read Romans 8, 3. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of what? Sinful flesh. Likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. But he came. That's the key. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelled among us. You go to 1 John chapter number 1. John says, man, we touched him. We handled him. The word of life. See, that sort of thing. It was an act of God. Act of God. I asked the folks, so what we did yesterday is this. There were, there were three of us there. We were ministers. You know, anybody can speak. But um, we took turns, one guy an hour. And I only spoke for about 15 minutes because everybody else left 
to go talk to people and, and we, we start through a microphone and, and, and uh, all that sort of thing. But I asked, because this question was asked to me one time, uh, and I thought it was really, really a good question, okay? Why? Why are we here? And that's how I began the message. And I, I spoke shortly out of, of uh, Romans chapter number five. Why are we here? We're here because God loves. It was his love that brought forth creation. See? Brought it into being. His love, desire to share himself with his creation. And I think we need to keep that in mind as we go through. God was behind not just creation, not just sending his son, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He brought him in the fullness of time. He came, all right? He came, but God was behind the cross. The cross wasn't just some willy-nilly, uh, perchance thing that was going to happen. The cross was not an independent act of God. It was not solely the result of the fury of men. The cross was an event within the plan and purpose of God. We're in Romans. Let's slide back to chapter 4, please. Chapter number 4. Notice, please, verse 25. Um, let's start with a full sentence here. Verse 22. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, speaking of Abraham and Sarah here. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered. Notice the word delivered for our trespasses and raised for our justification. What, what, what kind of word do you get? I mean, delivered, what's that bring to mind? It was brought to you. You know, in eighth grade, I, uh, I, I worked every Saturday morning with the milkman. Remember milk, some of you won't remember having milkmen. <laughs> when I was a kid, we had a milkman. And uh, he, he was a gentleman that uh, went to school with my mother. And he asked my mother, hey, does your son, would he like to work on Saturdays with me? You know, uh, that, that sort of thing. And my, my brothers and sisters loved it, all right, uh, because I'd bring chocolate milk home with me after the end of the day, you know, <laughs> small bottles. But we delivered. What? People didn't have to go out and find it. We brought it to them. And right here, what's it say? Who was delivered for our trespasses? It was an act of God, a deliberate act of God, and he delivered his son to this earth for a purpose. Say, for a purpose. You can read about that in Galatians 1, 4 also. But come in, in between here. Let's go to Romans 8. Okay. Romans 8 and verse 32 where it says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. There it is. He didn't spare him. He gave him up for who? Us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? I mean, it's a wonderment. <laughs> God was behind the cross work. God was also behind the resurrection. Uh, in every epistle that Paul writes, there's a mention of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, let's see, we're already in Romans. Let's come back to chapter 4 and notice verse 24. Okay? And we just read this. But for ours also, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. Now, actually, what's that verse saying? Because we always say, and Paul mentions it numerous times, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to say that in Romans. Now shall be saved. But what's it say here? Believe in whom? No. Believe in him who raised Christ from the dead. About the Father. You know, and we're going back many, many, many years when my dear wife got saved. Uh, we, we were going to a Baptist church here in Jacksonville, Florida, and she was singing in the choir. We were there three, four weeks. And uh, after church on that, that particular Sunday, she said, I'm never going back there. And, and Frank Shriver was the pastor. 
And he was an old-fashioned Southern Baptist preacher, man. I'll tell you what. And, and he had more stories than 10,000 people. But it was a blessing to be there and hear him. But my wife said, I, I'm never going back there. I said, how come? And she says to me, he's always pointing at me. Well, the problem was she was sitting behind him in the choir loft. And it took me a while to understand what was going on. It wasn't the preacher that was pointing at her, although she perceived that. It was the Word of God pointing at her, see? And she was raised in a Baptist church all her life. It was a good church, and, and, uh, but it never got into her. Well, I got up the next morning, noticing that she hadn't been in bed, and I says, are, are you all right? And she says, yes. I believed in God the Father last night. That was her words. Her words of her testimony about entering into a relationship with, with God. She didn't say Jesus Christ. She said God the Father. And, and eventually, you know, we ended up reading this. Believed in him who raised him or raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord. So what did Abraham believe? In him who raised Jesus our Lord. And he didn't know about Jesus yet, did he? But he believed in God the Father. So it's, it's a wonderment as, as you see these things. Come over to Ephesians. Let me give you two more verses here, and then I'm going to uh, slow down and quit here. I'm not going to quit. I'm just going to stop for the moment. Ephesians chapter number 2. Notice verse number 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Well, how in the world can we be alive with Christ? He had to be what? Raised from the dead. And, of course, that's what God the Father did, according to the Scripture. Raised them from the dead. And I go over to Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 13. And it says this to us. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Together. The powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, verse number 12. And you and I have shared in that. And man, that's a wonderment. So for Paul, the resurrection was not so much the achievement of Jesus as it was an act of God. So as Paul looks at God, the one God, there is one God, what's he perceive? Here's a father who is the creator, the savior, who has his hands in our daily lives as he did in Paul's life, as he did in our Lord Jesus Christ's lives, right? And why did he? Because he loved us. I mean, it's, how simple is that? Any Bible question you have, God loves us. That's what it's about. So behind every act of Jesus is God. And Jesus was the bringer of the love of God. I'm reading a book now, one of many, uh, Abraham, the father of the believer, it's called. But in there, there's a chapter about the, the Jewish attitude toward Jesus Christ. And then he brings Paul's attitude of Jesus Christ into it. And what he says is this. God came in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, to manifest the father image. I mean, what does Hebrews? Let's go to Hebrews real quickly. And I, I promise I'll close right here. This is how much God loves. And this is what the author was trying to get across to us. That God loves so much he brought himself down to mankind. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, though, or through whom also he created the world. So that's what we've been talking about. He is the radiance of what? Of whom? The glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So this Jesus, our Savior, points us continually back to the Father. What was that, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 1, first three verses. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. That's who Jesus Christ is. And Jesus Christ, throughout the gospel accounts, always pointing us to whom? The Father.
Keep that in mind, all right? Keep that in mind. And that'll be a blessing to you. You remember this, if you remember nothing else about this simple message about who, who God perceived God, or uh, Paul conceived God to be, is this. We're here because of him. For his purposes, not for our own. All right? Keep that in mind. God will bless you.